Hi, my name is Chris Little, and I am the host of The Lifestyle Chase. In 2018, I started this show to have meaningful conversations. I've interviewed over a hundred different people, both in and out of the fitness industry. This podcast is something I'm incredibly proud of. Welcome to season four. Thanks for joining me. All right. So welcome back to the Lifestyle Chase. Um, This is the first in-person episode that I've done in like the last two years. And uh, the video production went up by quite a bit. I think I've upgraded everything that I own. Um, And today I'm joined by Anthony Doe. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, I was listening to the last time that you were on the show. It was October 2019. Um, back when I was, uh, numbering the episodes, this would have been episode 85. Yeah. And we were talking about it off the air that this one, if it was numbered, would be something like 230 or something. Wow. So time flies. Yeah. Time flies. I remember where I was sitting and everything during that podcast. Yeah. Well, I just, I remember we talked about tea. I remember that it was like, it was a very quiet evening here, um, because we were in very different time zones at the time because you were in Iceland at the time. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, it's cool how we can kind of like reconnect after all these snapshots and kind of see what's happened in life, um, and what's transpired. Uh, what has been happening for you in the last like two weeks? Like let's unpack that. Two like. weeks. Um, let's see here. Uh, I was in Iceland again. That was actually the first time I was back in Iceland since we did this podcast, which yeah. is kind of full circle moment, but, um, I think like the rest of the world, I didn't travel for almost almost two years, like 18 months or something like that. I got a, a little bit earlier when it was kind of dicey to be traveling, but it paid off because now I came back and all the restrictions were lifted. So the world kind of got back to normal while I was out there, but I was out in Iceland for a month um, working on a tourism project. But three uh, back uh, when we spoke last, I was there working for Half Floor, but uh, different opportunities brought me back to Iceland. So what... What has life been like amidst like going through the pandemic and stuff? Has it been kind of business as usual for you? Because you kind of like are out and about, or did you have like some uh, some moments that had you kind of stop and reflect on things? Um, it was a mixture of both. Uh, I think for a lot of us, it was a forced time to look inward. But I love that kind of stuff. I'm very introverted. Mm-hmm. I like to have time to unpack my thoughts. And I think at that point, um, life had been going pretty fast for five or six probably four or five years actually, and I didn't really have time to catch up with my memories. I was just going from city to country, week after week, month after month, project after project, and um, the first month was heaven. I think I had to isolate for one month because that was the rules in Canada, Mm -hmm. and then um, I used that month to basically sleep. (laughs) For the first time, I got like deep rest, and then that first year was really interesting. I was expecting um, all my momentum to be cut off, like... Uh, most businesses were, but something interesting happened. Uh, Because I built my company around the world in different countries and stuff like that, I think that when it came to Canadian companies, I was never around to work with them. And there was a lot of um, buzz happening through friends and friends. And I'm lucky to have good people talk about my name in Canada. And when I came back to Canada, it was finally this like uh, massive opportunity to work with all these Canadian clients that I've been waiting to work with. So um, it was just interesting. It was just like uh, being able to pick up some of those conversations that couldn't go any further uh, years ago. So I was lucky. I had a lot of creative work um, through the first part of the pandemic and I still found my ways to find uh, travel within the country. But the biggest thing for me was I had to kind of redefine what travel meant for me. I thought I was going to like hit a low point because like I built my identity and my business and everything around the guy that went everywhere and did everything, but now I couldn't go everywhere and I couldn't do everything. So I thought I was going to hit a low point, but then I just realized that my travel was just about storytelling. So if I can meet new people and I can see new things and I can push my creative limits, that's like my travel. I never learned that about myself until this pandemic because I thought I always had to find that on an airplane going somewhere else. But yeah, I found it within the boundaries of Canada. And that was really liberating because um, everything is just more colorful outside when you travel. But if you can find that joy and stuff like that in such a um, small 
it's not really small Canada is huge but like uh, yeah it was a uh, it was pretty fun time but I still got to see so many different sides of Canada I found um, I traveled through the different provinces and I got the best part was I got all my work caught up which was impossible for the last five years because one thing just kept coming after another and uh, yeah I just came out the first or second year feeling like uh, prepared for everything like I caught up with rest and work and everything and I had got time to learn new skills and stuff so um, coming back onto the world about seven eight months ago was it was a it was like a different me that's awesome I mean like yeah. just getting sleep alone is <laughs> such a such a helpful aspect of like uh, sort of being able to reset and recharge. Mm. When you were traveling around within Canada, like what were the projects that kind of stood out to you the most or the little trips that stood out the most? Um, that was probably one of my favorite things was, it was that first Christmas that we all had in the lockdown. That was a special time because at that point I had about maybe six months or so to go through all of my hard drives, which is a lot of um, years of footage, but Within there, I found an opportunity to curate um, a fine art print collection. So I found my favorite photos of mountains in different countries, and I uh, put it into a collection that was going to sell uh, limited editions. And I wanted to test the market to see a new product. I've never printed my photos before, right? So I used that opportunity to pair up with a local print shop because at that time, supporting local businesses was really important. I mean, it's always important, but at that time, it was really hard time for everybody. So. Um, once I found a print shop to partner up with and I curated the photos of the mountains, I called it Summit and I took it to market through Instagram, which is crazy because I don't like, have a crazy large following, but the people that saw um, me put it out, it was just received really well and within the first week it all sold out and um, through that project, I just learned that there were people that wanted to like be more invested in like my photography and like hang my art which is kind of mind-blowing so that project was great but the best part of it, about that whole thing was I spent Christmas day and in, lo in lockdown with my mom because we couldn't really see our families at that point I don't know if you remember that but mm -hmm. um, me and my mom packaged up all these orders we fulfilled them together and that's like something really special for me and my mom because she's a businesswoman and she's retired now and she doesn't really get a hand in what I do for my work so I remember Christmas morning we have like this assembly line she's like um putting the prints in the tube, I'm wrapping them up in the paper, I'm labeling them, we have like a whole thing, I'm driving to the mail, uh, post office, coming back. That was great. Another good, really good project was, um, I got to travel a lot of BC with my friends and they're very talented creatives as well. And we got to explore the island, which is great because um, I think most people go to like Tofino and Eucalypt, sometimes Victoria, but we really got to see interesting parts of uh, the island um, because my friends are like crazy backcountry explorers. They get into nooks and crannies that I would never get into. And I remember this particular uh, cave where uh, my friends have been trying to go down there forever, but they couldn't because you can only climb down when the tide is low. And if you do get in there, there's always a risk that the tide comes back and you get trapped inside the cave kind of thing. But inside this cave is a waterfall with a hole in it and it just like spotlights down and uh, the seals come in and swim. It's just like kind of a Canadian paradise, right? And we just been like hypothesizing about this cave for a long time. And when we got there, the conditions were perfect. We climbed down. Uh, it was a little bit sketchy. There was six of us. Um, you kind of had to be decent grip strength. Kind of the, strip, the climbing played and came into play there. And um, we got in there. And I that's probably the most beautiful thing I've seen in Canada, like maybe ever. So. Well, it's crazy how things are just right in our backyard. Like we don't take the time to experience them. And then it's just... We only have so much time on this earth, yeah. like everybody's going to die. And it's like, how, for yourself, how do you create that balance of making sure your workload is enough that uh, you're providing for yourself while also experiencing things that are like once in a lifetime? Like, how do you navigate that? Um, I think that part of my life or my business got answered a few years ago. I... I was really struggling with the bad side of that question where um, I was just spreading myself thin and um, you know, there were seasons where the income was really high but I was doing projects I hated and then the projects that were really cool didn't pay that well and I just really had to figure out a way on how to marry the two things together and that's where I kind of leaned into specialization and niching yourself basically where 
um, you, I was willing to take a hit um, to kind of, or at least uh, set out through a drought basically of work to get the projects I wanted and to get them priced the way I wanted and stuff like that. I wasn't just going to take a desperate paycheck and sell my soul for a project that I would hate for two weeks kind of thing. So um, for a little while there, I just picked on projects that were considered bucket list things. It, or at least would take me to bucket list places or to meet bucket list people, that kind of thing. And if it was anything short of that, I would just respectfully decline. And there's so much I would do with my time. So I have no problem filling that time anyway. So um, I think being able to uh, go through that slightly challenging time to figure out what I really wanted out of the market and what kind of stuff I wanted to make with the kind of people I want to make in the places that I wanted to go. Um, I really had to really... I had to be specific about what I wanted. And then once I figured that out, the questions became clear what did I need to and answer and stuff like that. So I'm lucky today because the projects I do now, um, I can be very selective. I don't, I probably work on one tenth of the projects today than I did maybe a few years ago. And things are much more sustainable now. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it absolutely does. Like, I mean, for, for a lot of people that are listening, they're going to have a hard time like grasping the concept of like less is more mm. uh, because within the fitness industry, within anybody who's creative, um, it's just that hustle mentality where it's just like, you just have to get as much gig work as you can to make it work. But then we hit like this point where you start to realize that like when you get clear on like what you kind of want to work on or what you want to, what fulfills you, mm. um, then you can kind of get your worth within that realm because you're putting all of your effort into that and then you're making it more rewarding for you. Yep. Uh, yep. But it's it's a tough journey to come across. So it's mm -hmm. something that a lot of people will kind of struggle with for a period of time. And then sometimes that's just like the necessary like uh, pattern of events that people need to go through. Like you kind of have to struggle for a little bit to, to get into that uh, momentum. Absolutely. One thing that I was thinking about as I was kind of like getting ready for this episode is like part of what kind of got us back together is you put out the YouTube video and then I watched it immediately oh, and I was like, well, I mean, I was commenting, I was like, dude, you're coming back on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then ironically you did like a couple weeks later. So I mean, you couldn't have asked literally at a better time. I just got back to the country. I'm not here for very long. My plate is stacked, but just the nature of how this weekend unfolded, I needed a break from what I was working on, and you happen to be within the neighborhood, basically. <laughs> All the stars aligned, and I'm happy to do this. I love this stuff. Yeah, well, like, it worked out really well, because, like, yeah. what I try to remind people to do is, like, to go back to past episodes and to see, like, the snapshots mm -hmm. of a person's journey, mm -hmm. because we... We think that things should just be easy because we're seeing like a part of a person's progress that looks easy at that point. Mm. But when we see it like zoomed out, we start to realize like you do need to develop a certain amount of resilience and you do need to get your butt kicked a bit and you do need to fail and like try again. You're going to be let down. You're going to get some disappointment and you're going to have to make decisions. Mm. Um, but then if you keep at it and you keep putting in like effort, yeah. then it pays off. Yeah. And some of the things that stood out about the video was it kind of like encapsulated some of what the progression has looked like for you mm -hmm. and just like how now you are in sort of like, hold on, I just yeah. got to switch some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that sound, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's probably like brings back more memories for you. Just oh like, yeah. I know uh, the sound of yes. shutters. I mean, the sensor of shutting. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually, yeah, I've had that happen at the worst times on our job. That's why <laughs> that was a little bit PTSD right there. It's <laughs> rolling. Yeah. So essentially, when we recap what what that video is all about and just kind of showing that you're almost like, I would best describe it as like the flow state of your career. You kind of, yeah. you got everything set in stone. Like what yeah. are, how do you look at life now? Like what are the things that uh, dial in your compass when you're making your next moves? Mm -hmm. First of all, we're talking about like the mini doc thing I made. Yeah. That's like, okay, I just yeah. want to be clear about that. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, 
yeah, that video was really hard to make, as I explained. It's like this 23 minute long thing where um, I basically failed for a year and a half of making it. And within the making of that film, I learned almost everything I needed to in order to make that process like sustainable for me. Cause like, I think to go through that creative process where you suck and then you think you're just failing and stuff like that. And you just feel that resistance over and over. Yeah, I, I remember that and I was just like, trying to find ways around that, um, that, that feeling. And then when it got finally put out, I mean, finished, I sat on it for like a month. It was finished. I just sat with it before I showed the world. And then when I put it out, I remember you just like immediately messaged me and I was just like, oh man, this is, I, I was like getting nervous because like you were showing so much love and stuff. So I appreciate you watching that. Oh yeah. But when it comes to making decisions out there and um, figuring out what I want to do, everything is moving backwards from my big picture. And I know it sounds a little bit, um, it's not cliche, but like it's, uh, it's talked about more commonly now, but like moving backwards from the big picture for me means like um, asking a series of very specific questions for yourself. And they have to be pretty hard because they're the kind of questions that you don't want to ask yourself. They reveal a lot of ugly things that you don't like about yourself. And once you kind of get past that phase, everything else becomes very clear. So when I'm making my decisions on who to work with, what to film, um, where to take myself and all those things, those questions are seemingly easy to decide because I know a long time ago, I, I figured out who I wanted to be around and what feeling I was chasing and stuff like that, right? So. Um, for example, uh, the last six months, um, I left Canada in December and it's now, oh my God, what month is it now? May. It's May. It's May. I almost well, forgot well, too. Okay. So <laughs> it's been, it's been like six months. I think. Yeah. So, um, my decision to leave Canada and travel at that point, the restrictions are still in place. So it's a little bit trickier, but, um, I made all these decisions to start traveling early because, um, I wanted to be able to find discomfort out there and at least uh, take on some risk again. You know what I mean? Like, I think I got really comfortable during the pandemic. So um, I knew that I was going to do this because I value risk taking in my life. And I don't know if I'll always be this way. I don't know if anyone kind of loses that trait, but I saw it as like a chance to challenge myself. I, 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 I assessed it and it wasn't reckless. I think there was a time in the pandemic it was reckless to travel. But at this point, it was becoming more normal, but the masses weren't out there. So that's like me saying to myself, we're going to do this because it's going to be difficult. It's going to be strange. And you, it's like you've lost a lot of uh, what's called travel momentum. You know, you haven't been back out in the world internationally for 18 months. Let's go figure out what that's like. And let's go see if there's a, a way to apply our new storytelling things that we've learned through the pandemic and stuff. So through that, that's like step number one and then step number two is like what do I want to do and who do I want to do it with and um, I leaned into the people that inspired me most when I started thinking about where I wanted to go and um, that led me to French Polynesia. Uh, I was there in 2019 working with a nonprofit called the Coral Gardeners and I was only there for a week and I was just there as a filmmaker content creator at the time but through those years I stayed friends with the founder and some of the people on the team and I watched them grow exponentially. They were just a team of seven before, and then they started to work with like National Geographic and the World Surf League and all these amazing creators and stuff. And they just scaled globally. And I reached out to Titawan, who's the founder. I just wanted to come say hi, basically. I was just like, hey, I'm thinking about going out somewhere. Can I like fly through Tahiti and come see you in, on the island Maria? He's like, yeah, absolutely, come through. So I planned a week, uh, actually it was three weeks to come say hi, spend some time and just see what's going on over there. And as things happen seemingly frequently in my life, this three week visit extended to three months because conversations started flowing and you know we were really inspired by each other. I met his new team, there's about 20, 30 people now. And what I built for myself in the last five years prior to that moment was a perfect fit for what they needed in their organization. So we started to look at things with um, from a really zoomed out perspective and they're like, maybe I can stay here and we can mutually benefit from this. And this was perfect because I was around the people I wanted to be around. I was in a position that I had been dreaming about, which was more creative direction, project management, um, just bigger storytelling, not just creating videos and spitting out videos kind of thing. And then um, I was meeting new people that were incredible at their jobs. So like I was getting 
inspired by uh, these individuals exponentially because there was like 20 people there that I didn't know that were world class at their roles, which is super cool. And then the country alone, I mean, if you ever looked at a photo of like Tahiti or something like that, it's like the most beautiful place on the planet. So like it checked every single box. And if like that three months wasn't perfect enough, it was, it just kept getting better where opportunity was getting, um, was just building. And then after that, I went to Iceland for the month. So um, as I put myself closer to like the things that were important to me, all these doors just started opening. You know what I mean? Like I didn't plan for Iceland at all, but just the way things happened and the conversations that happened and people started seeing I was out there and I was just doing things that were important to me, you know, which is connecting people, telling stories, hearing stories, making films, creating art, um, trying to be present as possible. Um, That's what opened all these other doors after that. So I think that's, kind of like my whole point is just like uh, trying to stay close to the uh, to the values that make you and then uh, working backwards from the big pictures you know like I know what I know the general direction I'm moving in life and um, I'm happy to take the windy road to that not as long as I'm moving towards it I guess you know so for sure yeah well when you're in like French Polynesia and you're saying that they were gaining a lot of momentum at like an exponential Mm -hmm. pace what did that look like for them like was it based on business was it based on social reach what what were the logistics there? so they found growth I learned a lot from them because they're an organization of really young people but what they do well is they the they breed leaders you know what I mean everyone is a strong leader in their own department and when you have that, everyone is just working on all cylinders, cell- firing on all cylinders. It's, it's incredible to watch. And they found their growth by staying close to what they know well, which is like they really had to dissect and do their own reflection of their brand in this figurative mirror that we're kind of talking about where they're like, what do we do well and what, what do we suck at? And they just kept like playing to their strengths, you know? And so that meant like online, they knew what tone to speak with, what voice to speak with, what type of imagery and colors to work with, and what kind of people to collaborate with. You know, when for them and myself, and probably for your, for you and everyone else out there, when we start to collaborate with the world to try to figure out what we want, we're collaborating with everybody. You know, you start broad, and then mm-hmm. you narrow down your focus. But at a certain point, if you don't narrow down your focus and you stay broad for too long, you're gonna kind of have, have a lot of set of problems, like a massive set of problems, because now you're just catering too much, you spread yourself thin, you haven't done the work, you're not pulling the lessons from all these things that you're experiencing. So it's your job to experience all these things and then figure out and assess at each checkpoint what you want and then narrow it down again and then narrow it down again. And they just did it faster than other ocean conservation companies. And now they're the cutting edge leading in the world for coral restoration and they're doing it in a cool way. When you think of um, ocean conservation, it's like a boring textbook or an old website or an old person kind of lecturing you but they've taken social media, they've taken art, they've taken good storytelling, um, young mindsets, modern mindsets, and just um, ran with it basically, right? So I took note of that and I just decided to um, collaborate. Uh, I've always collaborated with people that I felt were close to me, but like um, I had to think twice about it and I, 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 I learned that I could narrow my focus even more. And that's yeah. what I've decided to do even more in just the last six months that I've noticed a massive difference already. The more specific you are about the questions you ask, I think that directly correlates to just um, how wonderful or not wonderful your life will be. I think if you're willing to ask the hard questions, you're going you're gonna to find a lot of joy in life because you're willing to do the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot that uh, comes up for me when I, when I hear you talk about all that stuff. And like one of those things was you talked about how as things start up, a lot of people are involved and then you refine that with, with time. Yeah. But from the standpoint of someone who's just kind of starting up, they're starting to pick up their momentum. What I find that is helpful is if they're saying like, okay, this is my goal. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And then from there you kind of, figure out who within your community Mm. is aligned with that. Mm. And in many cases, they can set you up with like work or opportunity or learning or mentorship or just guidance Mm. or like a lead by example situation where you get positioned to grow. And then from there, you start to kind of refine your process and stuff like that. But taking it back to goals, setting that initial goal, Mm. and you've had your goal and you refined it, what's your, your goal now? Like, what does your goal look like if you have to write it out on paper? 
So my goals have changed drastically. I would say around the pandemic time, because again, it was really introspective time for me and probably everyone. But um, the biggest difference between who I was and what I was doing before and who I am and what I'm doing now is that before I was selling a product, you know, you hire me, Chris, I'm going to make you a video, deal's done. But I think now, instead of um, being in the business of selling videos, I sell ideas. And, you know, ideas only really coming, uh, only really come from listening. And when people share their stories and you share your story, um, how well you listen determines like how well you can come up with a solution, you know, because if someone's telling you that they want something in the marketplace and you're listening and um, you actually are able to uh, hear that what they want is actually not what they need. And you're also, you're able to provide a better solution, something that they didn't know before, you will make a very rich income. And by rich, I mean not money. Like you, people will love you and you will feel fulfilled and there's a lot of meaning there, right? So I'm in the business of storytelling now. This is the way I put it, you know? I was in the business of making a video or taking a photo before, but that's just a very small piece to the storytelling business, you know? Now it's, I find myself sitting down with people like yourself talking more and through talking more and connecting and asking questions and exchanging stories, my business has grown tenfold and it's um, grown in the direction that I want because I'm sitting down usually with other storytellers, you know, you're a storyteller. That's why you have a podcast probably. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, that's the biggest difference. Now my goal is to be a part of or experience share or even just hear the best stories in the world. I've been chasing the best stories since the beginning when I set out on this endeavor and I didn't even realize that that was the mission at the time. At the time, it just felt like I was trying to become a better video guy, camera guy. But realistically, once all that fog passed with enough repetition and experience, I was like, oh, it's not about video because there's better filmmakers than me. I'm not the best, definitely not. But um, what I loved from all of that learning was that I love stories. And I've always loved stories as a kid. I just never saw it that way. I never had clarity about it. I never had someone in the last couple of years look at me and be like, what you're actually doing is about storytelling. It's not about making videos. So now that I have clarity about that, it's just like, where do I want to go? Who do I want to work with? Where does my time go? Is there a good story involved? Can we make a good story about it? Is there a budget for a story? Like, can we make a team for a good story? You know what I mean? So it's it, now story is king and that's my whole business. Absolutely. And I mean, like, even just within the fitness industry, just like being able to create that connection with a person where you are like helping them tell their story. Like if I'm the trainer and the client is getting this opportunity to tell their story, mm -hmm. they're getting the chance to talk about like where they started and where they're headed and what that looks like for them. Yeah. And then like the trainer is never the hero of the story. The trainer is kind of the, the guide or the consultant or the person that you lean on when you need, but they're not doing the reps. They're not putting in the work. They're not buying the groceries. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of something that I've learned as a coach dwelling uh, muchly in the online space. Like yeah. it's just, you rely on your ability to hear things. Yeah. So you brought up a lot of like good points in there in just the sense that like when you talked about, uh, how you can have sort of like wealth or abundance or like whatever that may be and mm -hmm. how it might not be like a monetary, but more so just like in the, the level of fulfillment that you get. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Like if a person is able to refine their listening skills and they're able to refine just their ability to understand what service or what solution a person may need mm -hmm. without them having mm -hmm. said it, mm -hmm. um, that's a, a huge differentiator. I, I think that, a lot of people drop out if they don't understand where they are in the story or where they fit in the story. Whether you're training somebody or sitting down with a big corporation and trying to close a, a budget deal, it's like you're telling a story or you're trying to tell their story. And if they don't understand where they are in that, they won't feel inspired by that because there's no connection, right? So it's your job to open up the story and be like, you're here and you're gonna train and this is what this is the direction we're going towards and this is what you're gonna experience, this is what you're gonna feel because I've gone there and my clients have gone there. It's the same thing. And it's your job to paint this world full of color, make it fun and make them understand that you're gonna hold their hand and walk through this world with them basically, right? And the better you can do that, the better friendships, better business, everything becomes better. You know what I mean? It's it's if you're if you're doing it right, you're telling a story. If you're doing it wrong, you're kind of selling something cold. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's true. So when life took you from Polynesia to Iceland, mm. 
what was happening there? Like what was going down? What were, what, what was your life looking like? Um, those two connections this year has just solidified my faith in small connections is, or I can't even call them small connections or small moments, but like f seemingly fleeting moments, moments that are seeming insignificant when you like bump into somebody you don't know and a small conversation starts. Um, those moments are gold to me now because I've done, I've done this for six years. I've been traveling and running my own business for six years, which is crazy because um, while that sounds cool on paper, what that actually means is I've just been living out of a suitcase and figuring out where I'm going to eat dinner every night for six years, basically. But um, my point is that I am, I, I, like, I, I, I look back on all opportunities that I have now and what the ones that I love, they were all from small conversations, fleeting moments. You know, when I um, started with the Coal Gardens in French Polynesia three years ago, three years ago, yes, um, that was a small conversation that started with just like a DM. And, and then when I got there in person to meet the, the people, um, it could have gone one of a million different ways, but it was the small conversations that were off the clock that made us stay friends. You know what I mean? Because there was inside jokes and we could go for food and have some drinks. And that's what was remembered of me when I have to come back. And same with Iceland, you know, when I was in Iceland working for Half Thor, I was using my downtime to collaborate with hotels and other creatives in the country. And because I was working with the Bubble Hotel at the time, who was famous for having probably the most recognizable hotel in the whole country, um, they loved my photos. I gave them probably the most viral set of photos they've ever had for their company. And uh, we it opened a dialogue and then we're just like we should go for coffee so I came to his shop and me and this guy Robert um, had coffee and he told me more about his business he told me his story and it was like a 30 minute meet that seemed like if you walked out it would be like, it would have made you feel like wow that was really fun I don't know if I'll see this person ever again that's how I felt when I walked out mm -hmm. he remembered me we started talking through the pandemic he told me his company was expanding beyond just bubbles and um, now we're working on a startup together and that's what brought me back to Iceland. So now I'm not in the business of selling videos, I'm helping people build their teams, I'm helping them build campaigns and building it from the foundation up, which is crazy because this is the sort of stuff people used to go to school for, you know what I mean? This is where you get the shiny plaque and degree to start building like companies and stuff. But because um, I've learned that, I've indirectly learned how to grab the building blocks and do all that stuff in my own experience, I just learned how to assemble it together um, with a little bit of time and practice. And now I have confidence that I can help these like, companies and people from the ground up. So it's pretty cool. The small conversations, they go the full distance. And people yeah. always think it's the big meeting, the conference room, or like the, the, the scary moments that matter most. Those do matter sometimes. But like how you leave an impression on someone has been my business card for six years now. That's it. Well, it's, it's crazy how true it is. Like in my experiences in my training career, every bit of momentum that I have today is same thing based on like small interactions. Like one of the person, one of the people that I work for currently, uh, Alex McBarity, him and I met in Kansas City and we hadn't like spoken to each other at Kansas City. Um, but there was one moment when one of our colleagues was just being super weird. Mm. And then Alex did this thing called like the aw awkward turtle. So it's like you make this hand signal with your thumbs and yeah. it's like, For sure, yeah. well, it's like in this instance, it was basically, I want to get out of this situation. It's super weird. This is awkward turtle. Get me out of here. I love that. And we <laughs> just kind of bonded over that. And it's cause like him, like him and I are both introverts. And so we didn't talk too much at this event. Mm. But because of that little moment, then we connect on Facebook and we start talking. And then over the years, we connect more. And then we got on a Zoom call and mm -hmm. we like talked about each other's origin story. Yep. And eventually he hired me on a, as a coach with him. So, yeah. And then like my work with uh, Beverly, um, that was through a Zoom call. I've never met her in person. And I'm mm -hmm. doing quite a bit of work for her each week. And then I do social media work. That person was on my condo board. And it's just like, I was messing around in, on Instagram. So she was like, oh, you can contract for me. So it's, it's yeah, absolutely true. You see it, yeah. You get it. Every, every interaction I can think of started from a small conversation. From the very beginning all the way to the end, I just never saw it until I had time to sit down and reflect on it. Absolutely. So when you're talking about like this business that's going on in Iceland and like you, the thing that stood out to me the most that you're sharing was how 
quite often people are so used to getting like that piece of paper, um, their degree, their business degree or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, we're going through the ebbs and flows of life and we're getting like, uh, experiential knowledge, like just through the repetitions. Um, what would you say has been the skill set that you are demonstrating now in that journey? Like what are the little meticulous things that are set you, setting you apart and enabling you to be successful within that realm? I mean, from aside from the thing we've just been talking about the most, which is storytelling, within that answer, there's like a million sub answers, you know? But I noticed the biggest difference in my life when I started to work on listening. And we already just touched on it for a second, but what I mean by that is like, when you listen well, um, that's one part, but what you do after you listen and how you communicate the information back to them or your thoughts or your feelings back to them um, is everything, you know what I mean? Yeah, It sounds like I'm talking about relationships right now, but I'm actually talking about like maybe business and just everything else. It's like, um, I, I started getting the opportunities I wanted or at least to be in the rooms that I wanted to be in from simply being able to make someone feel heard really well, I think, you know? And that wasn't a skill I've always had. I've always actually been a terrible listener because I like, I always thought that my, when I was much, much younger, I always thought my, my thoughts were more important. So I'd talk over people and I'd interrupt and stuff like that. But when you listen, that's one thing because you can stay quiet and someone will think that you're listening, but it's not until you can say what they've been saying. Um, the most um, elementary way to make someone feel heard is to say back what they said basically but the most advanced um way to do this really well is you say something i listen and not only do i explain it back to you i can metaphor it in a way that you've never seen it before does that make sense yeah so it's just like wow not only did you take in my information you internalize it and then you colored it with different colors and then you said it back to me that inspires somebody that makes them feel loved makes them listen that started closing everything that I ever wanted to be closed in terms of business that I wanted. And um, that's not a skill they teach you in school. That's not a skill that anyone tells you that is really important. Maybe um, a few different fields know that this is like a gold mine, like psychiatrists and stuff like that, or shrinks and stuff like that. Cause like, I don't know. I just, I just never saw the importance of it because that's not a business tactic. Usually you're taught to sell first and use tactics or, and, and tools within the, the salesman kit. But um, maybe listening some, somewhere is in there, but metaphoring. To use a good metaphor is to speak the same language as somebody that you don't know or do know, you know what I mean? Um, that's something I've been trying to do better at, and especially once I've learned that it works incredibly. Have you ever thought of metaphoring like that before? I have, but not like in the way that you've framed it. Like a little bit of a background towards what I do as an online coach, like in the work that I do, I'm working alongside someone with a psychology degree. Mm -hmm. So my friend Alex has his psychology degree. And so he'll use different uh, ways of like framing a situation Mm -hmm. with clients Mm -hmm. and we'll work on that. We'll work on like the tone of our conversation. Mm -hmm. We'll work on having like the client almost like answer the question without us like prompting Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the whole concept of metaphor is like, I'm definitely intrigued by that. It's like, that is like a rabbit hole that I want to dive down. (laughs) Um, It's it's kind of like, um, it's a little bit more complicated version of like, uh, catering to your audience basically yeah. it's like a, it's like a comedian going into uh six different rooms and every room is a different demographic you know like if you're gonna do a birthday party full of kids you're gonna tell different jokes and if you're gonna do a corporate event you're gonna do different jokes um same thing with metaphoring for business or personal reasons it's just like if i'm sitting across from you uh my job is to you could do it before or during the conversation it's probably more impressive if you do it during the conversation where you're speaking a certain way and i'm picking up on small nuances and tangibles and I'm able to um, bring that into my metaphor my storytelling to make you feel like you're more understood because if you're a car guy I can make analogies to cars you know what Mm -hmm. I mean but like if you don't adapt that in the moment then yeah you can get through but like you're really going to connect with people if you speak their language you know what I mean so maybe give it a shot next time you're having a conversation that you feel is really important it's it's something that you have to practice kind of in the moment, you know, because in the moment while you're talking to somebody, you have to 
uh, turn over information pretty quickly. You know, you say something, I listen, and then in that moment, I have to be able to come up with something that explains that I understand you really well. And if you don't understand someone really well, and you don't know the metaphor, then you ask them questions to get more information. It creates a great conversation. Yeah, yeah you well, can do one of the first examples I thought about is because like you, you kind of grew up in the, the cameras area, right? Cameras, yeah. So doing a presentation in Cameroons would be very different from doing a presentation in like Kelowna yes. or something like oh, that. Oh yes, oh yeah. And so that would be a great example where uh, just creating these metaphors would uh, pay off dividends because people would kind of feel like more of a strong connection, I think. Yeah, I'm going up against the, the biggest challenge, the biggest boss in this context where this week I'm, we were just talking about I'm going to a school to speak to students. I've sat down with a lot of different people in a lot of different countries and metaphor it a lot and all this, I've never sat down to story tell or to try to connect or bridge anything with kids before. So I'm very nervous. And um, the reason why I'm doing it is because I wish somebody came to my school and told me that there was reasons to uh, do things off the beaten path. And there was, there's other ways, you know what I mean? So there's conviction in me to do it, this uh, talk with them, but I have, to, my preparation is not the message and the storytelling. It's not, what material I'm going to do, it's literally just how I'm going to metaphor with them. You know, I have to be able to speak the same language as these 13, 14, 15 year old kids do. I don't know what's relevant or cool. So hopefully I figure it out by the time your podcast is out, I'll be done that, but oh, I'm nervous. Well, the amazing thing is that from my experience working with people in the age group of like 13, Mm -hmm. um, because one of my clients, he's like, yeah, I think he just turned 14 a few months ago. Yeah. And so I've learned how to connect in all kinds of different ways yeah. from training him in person. And it's crazy how good kids are at connecting. Um, right. even my nieces, like yeah. they are like, uh, turning 10 and 14. Yeah. And so it's just like, they're just honest. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything to hide. If it's raining out, they'll tell you. Yeah. If it's a great day, they'll tell you. Yeah. They're not going to try and impress you the same way an adult might. Sure. Um, and they're just so much more authentic just because they're finding their way through the world. Yeah. And they're much more inspirable. Mm -hmm. Where if I talk to someone that's like 40, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily going to get as much buy-in when I'm talking about like a career like mine or like yours. Right. Um, whereas if I'm talking to a kid, mm -hmm. a kid is going to have buy-in. Like yeah. A kid is going to be yeah. thinking, I want to do that when I grow up. Mm -hmm. They're much more literal. Yeah. Um, and they are more, they are more autonomous than what we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. We're thinking that kids are going to have such a bias because of their parents, but you can create moments with kids that you would have never realized. And like the best way that I can think about that is because like, like background on me is my parents are both like retired teachers. Mm -hmm. So I've just been surrounded by teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, my sister-in-law is a teacher mm -hmm. and I've learned how much of an impact that teachers can have on kids. Based, like it's just based on seeing the experiences yeah. of my parents reflecting on yeah. that, their past students and also just like how much my high school teachers and oh. junior high elementary teachers like huge like not all of them but some yeah. are just they've they're the reason that I do certain things in my life today mm -hmm. and just simply because of little things that they said mm -hmm. and some of it is like no I'm going to show you what I can do mm -hmm. and some of it is like I'm going to make you glad that you believed in me. Mm -hmm. Like those little moments where like, you know, oh yeah, everybody else in this space is going to think it's impossible. Yeah. But I think if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Yeah. And it's I, just like it. I love that. I'm going to use that insight and uh, I hope it, if it doesn't go well, I'm blaming you. Oh but, yeah. But, <laughs> but I, no, I love that. I'm taking note of that right now. Well, it, it's just cool because it's like every moment is like, you're never going to get the same moment twice. Um, and so the fact that you'll get this is like, we talked about wealth and abundance in a non monetary way. This is one of those like really rich moments where it's like, wow, I never knew how much impact I could have in like an hour or two. Mm. And so that's like, I am vicariously excited for you mm. through that because I know just like how much, uh, can come from a little thing like that. 
Yeah. And when you think about the, the compound effect, like if you yeah. think about your first video, like right now, one of the video streams is filmed on a camera that is pretty much the same camera as you first filmed on. Very true. And just like, what little moves did you do to go from that first camera to the camera that you have today? Yeah. And then like, if we turn the table, it's like, what moves did I have to do to go from like my first podcast microphone and yeah. my first computer to yeah. like the setup that we got going on today? And it's just, all of those kids are going to have that same path. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what they could become, mm -hmm. but we have a pretty good idea of what can set an impression on them and what can leave an impact and like what they're capable of doing over a 10 year span. So that, that lights me up. I'm excited to hear how that goes. Thank you. I hope it goes well. Um, I am excited that it's a first for me. I think you kind of just said something similar, but like it's, it's something I've grown to love over the past few years is just doing something for the first time again. There's a tremendous fear and discomfort with it. Grown to love that feeling because great things are on the other side of it. But this is a really, really different one. I haven't done anything remotely close to this, so I hope it goes well. I have a friend that um, I was telling about this speaking engagement, and she was like, oh, I already know this is going to be the first of many. I was like, you can't be sure of that. She's like, oh, I just know. And, um, who knows? It could fail catastrophically, or I could fall in love with it, but I'm going to treat it like everything else and try to make my mark on it, I guess. Well, some of the things that I want to like pull from this conversation right now is just, I had the chance to listen to our episode in its entirety from like back in October, 2019. And there's so many like common, like consistent things, which I personally take great value in. I like to see when somebody is like ascending, like they're moving up, yeah. but there's certain like pillars to their life that stay the same. And the things that kind of stood out in our conversation before was you pointed out that it's important to you to always be a little bit uncomfortable and put yourself in new situations. Yeah. And this is it. This is the uncomfortable new situation it is you've acclimatized to so many crazy yeah. things that you had to find something that's like, yeah, simple. Yeah. But still uncomfortable. It's true. I appreciate you um, pulling something from not that far ago because I, I, it's hard to remember where my mind was at the time. Yeah. So it's pretty cool to be able to hear what, where my mind was or how I was articulating. But um, I think through the pandemic, I got I got comfortable in my own way. You know, I was still moving around a lot and finding different ways to live. But um, I I realized that I, I lost this killer instinct mindset that I had in the beginning. And what I mean by that is like in the beginning, I was willing to risk it all for my dream. And let's call that the mindset of playing to win, you know, playing, playing to win life sort of thing. And then somewhere in there, I got really comfortable, you know, you started to get work that is recognized and things are going well and, you know, boxes are getting checked off. And then I'm afraid to lose some things that I've gained and acquired and stuff like that. And you're starting to play the game differently, you know, you're playing not to lose at that point. And I realized, uh, I didn't realize when I fell into that mindset, but um, once I understood that my mind shift, my mind shifted, um, I really wanted to get back to the ways of where everything started in the beginning, you know, where you're willing to roll the dice for the dreams again and not be so comfortable with it. And I was just basically paying an ante to play a hand and I was just, just, just playing for the sake of playing. But, um, now I think hopefully with how this year has started and how the last six months have gone, I'm back out here doing things that are, um, taking higher risks and trying to put myself in more comfortable and uncomfortable situations like the speaking engagement. So this is probably something I wouldn't have done not too long ago, you know, but this is um, me trying to like play to win again. Cause I think this could maybe open other doors. Who knows? We'll see on the next third episode. of the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of the things that kind of stood out to me as you're, as you're sharing about that, you talked about just like the playing to win and what you're willing to do in order to get like what you wanted out of the opportunity. Right. I'm pretty sure I remember watching like your Instagram story or your Instagram feed or whatever it was at the time when you were like doing like the showcasing just how minimal your life had become. Oh yeah. So you're kind of showing how you packed the camera equipment and just how few possessions you travel with mm. in order to allow yourself to do the things that you're doing. Yep. And it was just like, like sometimes people think that, oh yeah, I can do that, but then they don't actually try it. Like that yeah. takes like some balls 
to go and actually do that. <laughs> it's just like it's a big deal. Like it's, all of a sudden, it's kind tough. Of, you're I, pulling your roots out a little bit. It's it's tough. I think if there's one thing that we all had to be challenged with consistently across the board with this pandemic was that we had to really question what was essential. You know, for me, I was I was cutting down what was already not very much. But I mean, when we're all out here asking what's essential to us, I mean, the, the comical side of this question is just like people running to the grocery stores and hoarding toilet paper and stuff like that. That's a different type of essential question asking. What I'm talking about more so is like, uh, does this lens need to be my professional kit? You know what I mean? I have four, can I get it down to three? Maybe that, whether it's uh, the right decision or not, I, I'm asking the question, which is really important. It's the same thing for company in my life or what material things I own, or at least mindsets or literally everything. My mind is conditioned to think like, do I need this at all times? I'm really bad at, oh, I'm actually really good at throwing things away. Cause like, it's like a hobby of mine. Like if something stays near me for like six days, like a pen and I haven't looked at it or touched it, it's gone. You know what I mean? Like I'm so always trying to remove things out of my life because it leaves more room for other things and stuff like that. So figuring out what's essential was exactly what you're talking about. The minimalism has become a part of me now. It's not just like a, a phase in my life where it was in my twenties and maybe my thirties. Uh, some part of this is going to be with me forever where I'm always figuring out what and who and everything that's important to me or essential to me. Well, I mean, even that answer answers another question that had been on my mind, just like thinking about just like, bandwidth and time and like productivity and stuff and I can imagine that you'd probably have to break it down to like what is serving me and what is not and like how how can I meet my overarching goal through the hours that I have today but like to to toss it back over to you like if you have a work day how do you formulate that out for the highest like return on on your efforts yeah, I, prioritizing is tough because um, I can weight things differently. So I can basically justify any task being more important than other, which is very dangerous because it should definitely be, this should be done first and this should be done last. But because I have that creative side of me, I'm going to call it the creative side, but that might be an excuse where I'm just like, uh, I want to work on things that are inspiration based. You know, I might have a project that is pressing, but this one is just so exciting, I need to do it now. And that's where I can get a little um, weak on my work ethic and structure. But for me, I figured like, um, I I don't want, I, I have to play through conversations that haven't happened yet to see what I can work on. And what I mean by that is just like, if I don't work on this thing right now, how does that conversation sound with that person? If I can't bear that thought of it, I have to do that first. <laughs> because it's like, they I'm respecting someone else's time. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like being late to something. It's just like being late for yourself is one thing, but wasting another person's time will make you feel a certain way. And if you can kind of empathize it that way, that's what's allowed me to stay productive or at least um, get things done when they need to, I guess. Did that answer the question? 100%. Like yeah. the way you frame it, just like how does that conversation sound <laughs> with that other person? Like, oh yeah, that hits different. That, uh, that can make a person create a sense of urgency with, certain things that they wouldn't have otherwise had it with like if if there was something that you wouldn't have otherwise em emphasized because of your own experience with that thing but your experience with that person added more weight to it then all of a sudden like yeah. you need to get that to faster it's just a matter of respecting other people's time i think and i mean it just it just sounds silly when you play it out loud it's just like if i didn't finish a project and i talked to that person on the day we're supposed to meet they're like, hey, so did you finish? I was like, I didn't do it. Where does the conversation go from that? How do they look at me? How do I look at myself? It's just like a disappointment I don't want to deal with myself. So uh, just do it. That's more motivating to me than most things. 100%. So lately for my episodes, I've been doing a different thing to kind of like encapsulate it all. Tell me. So I get people to do a challenge of the day. So you're going to give the audience a challenge for the day and you can even like look in the camera when you're talking. Mm -hmm. But uh, just something that you think would make their life better, would uh, maybe put them out of their comfort zone. Mm. Simple, that's accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah, okay. I know exactly what to challenge these people with. Which camera should I look at? That should way. I challenge this camera? Yeah. I'm gonna challenge my old camera. This camera is my first camera ever. Perfect. Um, my challenge from me to you is think of your favorite story. Um, one that you could tell inside out. You would tell it at the bar, you tell family functions, you tell it 50 times to your spouse, that kind of story. You love it. 
try to tell that story in 60 seconds or less and see how you go. And if you fail, do it again. And then if you fail again, do it again. Do it until you can, and then figure out what is essential to that story. That mindset, that framework will open up doors. I agree. I, I will try that challenge myself. And with that, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, man, it's been super fun.